I'm Jane McNeil. I've been working at the Marine Biological Laboratory since 1979. And um, right now I am the administrator in the Office of Research and Programs working with Jonathan Gitlin. I was hired by Mort Mazur, who was at the time the assistant director, working under Paul Gross. And um, it was a very interesting experience. I had, no, I had been living in Hyannis for several years, and I had never been to Woods Hole. I had no idea about it, but I saw the ad in the paper. They were looking for an admissions officer. That's what my first title was here. And they had an ad in the paper, and I applied, and I came for the interview, and I was blown away when I drove down Water Street and saw Woods Hole for the first time. I had just no, no sense of it at all. And um, they, had over, they had over 100 applicants for the position, and he narrowed it down to five. And I was the only one who didn't have a bachelor's degree. I had an associate's degree in secretarial science at the time. I've gotten my bachelor's since, but at the time, um, he was going to just drop me out right away just based on that and just pick someone who already had a bachelor's degree. And I sent him a note saying thank you for the interview, which I had learned to do at, in my secretarial science classes. And so he hired me right away. <laughs> so it worked out really well. And um, they called it an admissions officer, but it wasn't like at a university. Really, all I did was the paperwork to get the students here and you know the course is arranged and the application through to the directors. Um, you know about MBL's educational courses, the directors actually choose the students that they take into their courses. So there was a lot of paperwork involved back then, nothing was electronic. So that's what I was doing for Mort. And he had just started um, a program where they had five courses over the January break. I remember one of them was taught by Fred Bang, and so I got to meet him and Betsy, and um, it was great. It was a great time to be here because people were just starting to really um, wanting to do more with the educational programs and have them more often, and Mort started the short courses, which are like the analytical and quantitative light microscopy course and optical microscopy in biomedical sciences. So those were two of them. He did some computer courses as well and some other things that um, really made for a much more active community in the off season. And so I was all a part of that and it was really fun. We used to have a great time. We had, um, for every short course on Thursday night, they would have a lobster dinner. So we would all go to that and have a little party at, you know, to celebrate the course. It, they started Sunday night and ended on Friday morning. And I remember after like three or four weeks, I was actually tired of lobster. It was so rich and I never expected that to happen. Oh, that's when I met Dr. Inouye for the first time. Um, he was teaching the analytical and quantitative light microscopy course. And I think that must have been in the spring of 1981. If I came here in 79, the short courses I believe started in the fall of 80. And they started with the optical microscopy course taught by Bob Allen. So I got to meet Bob Allen as well. And then, um, Dr. Inouye started with the course in the spring. He did his in May and Bob did his in October. And um, they were great. They were so fun. We used to go over there and, and work with them and, and you know help them out and do whatever they needed to be done because they didn't have a lot of lab assistance. So even though I was doing secretarial work in the office, you know, Mort would always call me over and say, oh, come over and help the course. And so it was very enlightening for me because I had no experience. And I remember the first time I had to learn to say the word microscopy. Like I didn't even know how to pronounce it. So it was, it was a pretty good, it was challenging. I had come from Mount Holyoke College in the physical facilities plant, so I had no background in science. In the summertime, we weren't very busy because um, the students were here. So my office in particular that was handling students coming and going wasn't very busy. So Mort decided that we should start a um, secretarial pool and offer typing to the scientists because they needed it. The visiting scientists in the summer didn't bring secretaries with them. They might bring lab help, but they still needed to write papers and do correspondence, do recommendations, and they needed someone to type. So, um, and Mort knew how well I typed and how quickly I typed, so I started that and I hired a couple of the scientists' wives 
that were here for the summer that could type as well. And we had a little pool down in the uh, Lily first floor. And we did all this typing because this was, um, we weren't even doing word processing yet. We didn't start that until the early 80s. So we were typing them all on IBM Selectrix. And um, there was a lot of work. In 1982, they had a change in management. They let Mort go. Um, and I didn't like the direction that the educational courses were taking. Not that I had anything to do with this, but at the time I thought, oh my, I didn't like the way they were handling it. So I left. And, um, you know, I was, I don't know, I must have been about 30 and I had all these principles now and, you know, I thought this was the thing to do. And I woke up the next morning and thought, no, what am I going to do for work? And I had met the people at the job shop, Dave and Ruth Shepard, and they were, um, they ran the, um, a, a production company, so they printed brochures for us. They did all the short course brochures, all the educational uh, posters that we used to send out. They printed all of those. It was like a print shop. And so um, I, I knew them from here, and I talked to them about what was I going to do now that I was out of work, and they suggested that I rent an office upstairs in their building. They're at the corner of Water Street where the radio station is now, and they suggested that I rent an office upstairs and I start typing. And so I did, and I started typing for MBL scientists because they all knew I typed, and there was plenty of work. And um, Dr. Inouye hired me to type his book, Video Microscopy, of which there were many, 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 many revisions. Um, all done on an IBM Selectric, all done with um, a ball that you take in and out every time you need to make a symbol. So the one ball has all the letters and one ball has all the symbols. So you have to keep switching back and forth and the book was filled with equations and symbols including Dr. Inouye's name who has an accent over the last E. And then every time he's referenced in that book, which is a zillion times, I had to take it out, take it out, take it out. So it was a challenge, um, but fun, really fun. And he kept, kept me employed that first year, absolutely. I did more work for him than anybody else. He was the best person that anyone could ever work for. And I know some people have told me, like, he could be very demanding. Um, I know when he was originally getting some of his grants done through some of the people in administration in the Candle House, I heard women say, oh my goodness, he wants everything to be perfect. Um, but he and I worked like a team, and, and I never felt that kind of pressure from him. I always felt that uh, he understood what he, he knew what he wanted, so he was very direct about it. And if I couldn't do that, he was very accepting of how it was, I was going to have to do it, you know, how it was going to have to get done. Um, but he taught me a lot. He is the son of a diplomat, and as a result, he is very diplomatic. And I've never worked for anyone that's been so, um, uh, so professional and yet so warm and so communicative and still remained professional. And that's been an absolute pleasure to work with somebody like that all these years. And I got close to him and to his wife and you know, knew about his family and, and um, just really enjoyed being a part of their lives in the way I have been for many, many years. And I actually just stopped. Um, I helped him on the side do some of his personal bookkeeping and, and record keeping because that's what I'm good at. And um, we decided that it might be a good idea for his daughter-in-law to take on that, that work just a few months back. And so <clears throat> we talked about it, and it was decided that I would move on. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great, because I'm very busy now with my new job and some other things in my life. And it was like, good, you know, I'd like the free time. And the minute he told me I wasn't going to work for him anymore, I started to cry. I had no idea how emotionally you know, draining that would feel because we've been so tight for so long. Um, but, you know, the fact that I've been able to help him, and he's always told me that, you know, that he was as, as successful as he was in part because he had good people backing him up to take care of the administrative things that, he, you know, he didn't want to take the time to do or, you know, take away from the science to, to get involved with. I remember once um, he told me something. Um, he was, he was concerned, he had somebody working in his office, um, or in his science, in his lab, and he was concerned that this person um, 
wasn't going to be as successful as a scientist as Dr. Inouye wanted to see him be. And he was, he came to me and, I mean, I don't think he came to me for advice, but he was just talking it over and he said, I'm concerned. And I said, well, what makes you think he won't be as successful? And he said, because he doesn't sleep overnight on a cot in the lab. The production that I did in that office, we ended up hiring three more people and then opened a second office in Falmouth on Locust Street because there was just so much typing to be done and people were anxious to have quality people do it. Um, one of my um, associates typed um, the first transcription of the voice tapes that were made by Bob Ballard when he discovered the Titanic. He had recorded it and brought it back here to Woods Hole and asked us to transcribe it, so she was the first one who heard it, which was pretty cool. So we had a lot of opportunity to work for some really wonderful people over the course of the years. And I started that in 1983, and we closed shop in 2000. Well, I did a lot of typing for Albert St. Georgie, and he was the only Nobel laureate I knew at the time. <laughs> I know more now. <laughs> But at the time, he was the first I knew. So that was very important to me to get to type for him. In 1992, John Burris, I guess it was 1991 maybe, John Burris invited me. He was the director then. He invited me to come here. Um, it was at a time when life was getting more litigious and they were concerned because they did not have anyone to handle their equal employment opportunity concerns. If there was any kind of trouble here, if anyone had a problem, they didn't have anyone to go to that could help them with situations such as any kind of harassment or discrimination. And, you know, John wanted to make sure that the lab was protected, so they decided to hire me. Um, they thought I would be a good person for people to go to, one, because um, I wasn't management and you don't want them, people aren't going to go to management if they're in trouble necessarily, and two, because I already knew everybody and everybody knew me, so it wasn't like uh, people wouldn't come to me. Um, so I started that job, they hooked me up with Susan Gu, who was the HR director at the time, and um, I was happy to get the job. I hadn't, um, when I had worked here, um, in, from 79 to 82, um, they did not have an HR director. Um, there was an accountant, um, the, the CFO, his name was Ed Casey at the time, he's the one who actually hired me. So they had it going through their financial services office instead of through a human resources office. And um, I actually did have a problem with harassment uh, from something that happened to me here. Um, and I didn't have anyone to go to, and it was frustrating. You know, I didn't have anyone to talk to about it. I wasn't going to bring it to my boss. It seemed like, you know, the thing about harassment is if it happens to you, you take it personally and you think you've done something wrong. So it's not something you want to tell other people about. You think somehow you created the situation. That's not at all what happened for me, but I, I didn't know what to do with it. And so when they gave me the opportunity to help others, I jumped at the chance. And Jonathan Gitlin approached me and asked me if I wanted to come and work in the Office of Research and Programs. And actually, that had always been my dream job since I started here. We did education, but when I worked with Mort, he also handled the space assignment. And it was always my dream to work at that with him so that I would get to know the summer scientists on a, you know, a more personal level and a more uh, you know, helpful level that I could serve them. And, um, but I never got to do that because I was busy with the courses. So. Um, it was always like, oh, I would love to be working with the Whitman investigators now. That would be so fun. And when Jonathan offered the job, I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that that would be a possibility. Um, and also to become part of the affiliation. You know, Jonathan is at the forefront of affiliating us with the University of Chicago. And, you know, anything that I can do to make the MBL successful and move forward is, you know, is really dear to my heart. So I'm very committed to this institution. So that's interesting, uh, because that's something that Dr. Inouye and I have talked about endlessly. Um, I think the way it's changed mostly is in government uh, regulations. 
and the things that the government has insisted that we do that we didn't used to have to do, which has created a lot more work for everyone and a lot more staffing needs. Um, the grants are a lot more complicated. There's a lot more um, uh, compliance that needs to be done, and all of that takes time and energy on somebody's part. And so you have to hire people to do that. And Dr. Inouye was always like, I don't see why it can't run just like it did when Homer Smith and Florence Butts were here and they took care of everything. And it was great because they did take care of everything, but the needs were not as great. And I, keep trying, I kept trying to tell him over and over again, but you know, now we have to worry about things like discrimination and harassment and compliance and conflict of interest. And all of that takes time and energy from people that you've, you've got to have the staff to do it because it's a requirement. You can't get federal money if you're not doing those things. And so I think that's blossomed into, you know, the accounting systems are much more complicated now. You need a lot more staff to, to make sure those are all in regulation. You need an IT department that's twice the size that it used to be. I mean, everything's electronic now, and all that has to be covered. It takes a lot of people. That takes more organization. So I see that they've become bigger and more professional. And so, you, you know, there's a trade-off with that. You lose the personal, individualized attention. And I think one of the things that the MBL staff struggles with is that they try to continue to give that personal individualized attention and still do everything else. And it's an enormous effort. Well, first of all, it's the location. I mean, anytime I think I don't want to work here anymore, all I have to do is look out the window. I mean, who doesn't want to work in Wiss Hall? It's just beautiful here. Um, but I think it's the people. I think the people are really genuine and um, you know, I think the staff cares enough to be as helpful as they can be, and that makes it easier for people to come here. Um, and the chance that they get to be together. You know, I know there's a lot of history and or a lot of talk about, you know, we don't want to make this place look like a summer camp. We are a very professional organization, and, and we are. There's no doubt about it. I see the, what goes on behind the administration, and they work extremely hard and extremely professionally and extremely, extremely effective to make this operation run. I know there's been some money concerns, but even so, with as little money as we've had that we've done so well is a miracle because people have worked really hard at that. So I know that they're capable and competent, but sometimes they'll talk about, you know, you don't want MBL to look like the summer camp. But while you might not want to call it that, nobody had a better experience in life than they did at summer camp, really. I mean, when you think back to it. And to have that opportunity now in, in, your, in your vocation to be together with others doing that together as a group and having a chance to like go fishing afterwards or you know go out in your kayak and still come back and talk about science and have it all there in one place I mean that's a dream come true that really is I'm just um, I can't think of a better place to be